That's one of the songs that's going to be sung at my funeral. Great is thy faithfulness. This past week, Ernestine and I have moved from one house to another. A friend of mine has said that he's going to contact the American Webster's Dictionary publishers and change the, the definition of gypsy and put my picture there. <laughs> we have moved so often recently. And there were a number of folk in our congregation helped us. And to say thank you seems so shallow and so puny, if I can use that word. But we thank them so very much. And oftentimes, it is the same with God. When we say, thank you, Lord, sometimes it just doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't say all that needs to be said, does it? It doesn't feel full. It doesn't feel all that should be said to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for grace and mercy and peace, all those theological things. Thank you for health and strength. And I know there are members of this congregation who even this moment are struggling with your health. But we can still say thank you, Lord. Thank you for medicine. Thank you for doctors and nurses. Thank you for the capacities and the abilities they have to help us to reduce our discomfort, to give us hope, and give us peace of mind. The, the, the young man by the name of David, who started out as a shepherd, was anointed king, was resented by Saul, the king of Israel. He became a warrior, a fugitive. He became ultimately the king of Israel. And then he was a fugitive again, running from his own son, wrote words that sometimes you have to wonder how could he pen those words. And Psalm 100 is referred to as a, a psalm of giving grateful praise. Praise is another way of saying giving grateful thanks. Today in our world, we, we are a little confused about who deserves thanks and who deserves praise. Our politicians think that they need to be praised, and some of them do. They're honest, and they work hard, and they have the interest of people they serve in their mind. Our athletes, they think they should be thanked and praised because of they can kick a ball, throw a ball, or put a ball through a hoop, but they ultimately disappoint us, don't they? The entertainment world thinks that they should be thanked and praised, even religious leaders are arrogant enough to think that they should be praised and thanked for what they do. And the religious leaders are just honored by God allowing them to do what they are able to do. <clears throat> psalm 100 is an interesting psalm, and I want to read it to you. It's familiar to you. Some of you probably can quote it. And here's what David said. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his house with thanks, gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And as a result of that, we're able to enter his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. David tells us to worship the Lord, and then he tells us why we should be grateful. In verse 3, he says, the Lord is God. And my dear friends, that's primary. That's the primary reason to be thankful, because the Lord is God. And if you look at the original text, he's referring to Elohim and Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God, Elohim. In the beginning, God is a cause of stumble for many people. 
But David would have us to know that we ought to be thankful because it is God who is our Lord. The Lord is God. It's primary. And through the centuries, there's a lot of wonderful things that have transpired because individuals have come to the, the core belief, the, the, the bone-deep belief that the Lord is God. And, you know, there's a lot of pagans, there's a lot of idols, there's a lot of things that people worship. But when we come to understand that the sovereign who spoke the world into existence, who said, let there be light, and there was light. When we understand, and it is deep in our soul, that there is but one God, and he is Lord, and he is sovereign, then some wonderful things can take place. I was raised in church. I can't remember not going to church. During the Great War, some of you remember that war, World War II, we lived five houses down from church in Chicago. Neither rain, nor snow, nor sleet, nor hail kept us from going to church. And then we moved from there to the south side of Chicago, and the church had, two, had three apartments. The pastor lived over the sanctuary. We lived in the back. We went down the stairs. We didn't even go outside to go to church. But I had to come to the conclusion that the Lord is God. I mean, I had heard all the stories. I was in Sunday school. I knew all the stories. But there came a point in my life when I had to finally acknowledge that the Lord is God and beside him there is nothing. And when you come to that understanding, wonderful things begin to develop in your life. Do you remember Job? It is believed that his is the oldest book in the Bible. Job never did get an answer to his questions. Why have I lost my children? Why have I lost my, my wealth? Why is my body racked with, with sores? Why is my wife telling me to curse God and die? He never got the answer to those questions. But he understood who God is. And at one point, he was finally able to say, though he slay me, though he kill me, yet I will trust him. There's few of us that have ever suffered like, like Job. We've all suffered, but not like Job. And the testimony of millions of people throughout the centuries have been that when they came to the point of understanding and believing down deep in their soul that the Lord is God and there is none other beside him, that there were wonderful things, it carried them through. It carried them through. Now, we're not always successful at that. There are times when things are going on in our lives that, that we struggle with. I, and I'm, I'm going to confess, okay? Turn your collars around so I can confess. <laughs> a few years ago, in, our, in the ministry we were in, a, a, vir a, a, a parasite attacked my, my intestinal system. I lost 30 pounds. I was, I, I was going to a doctor every month for a year. I was in bad shape. And I, I got so bad that I was sitting on the back porch and I literally wrote out a list of people who deserved what I was going through. <laughs> and I had a couple of my friends say, my name wasn't on that list, was it? You see, I, I, had, I had forgotten for a while that the Lord was in charge. There was a re I don't know the reason, but the Lord is God, and, and when we suffer, when we go through this, this thing, sometimes our faith falters, and that's why the body of Christ is so important. So that when we, our faith becomes weak, and we forget what we really know, that our brothers and sisters in Christ can hold us up, can lift us up in prayer and encouragement. And remind us that the Lord is in charge. The Lord is in charge. He's God. Abraham didn't have a clue where he was going to go. God said, listen. In fact, Abraham was a pagan. He, Ur of the Chaldees is in Iran. He was an Iranian, what we would call an Arab. And he was a pagan. And God sovereignly called him and said, Abraham, if you will follow me, if you will go where I lead you, I will give you the land where your feet are where you step. 
He didn't have a clue where he was going, but somehow he came to the bone deep realization that God was true and real and he trusted him and he ended up in the promised land. His family ended up in the promised land because the Lord is God. And when Moses led a couple of million Hebrews out of Egypt and he faced the Red Sea, he didn't have an idea how he was going to cross, but he knew that the Lord is God. He had met him at a burning bush. He had met him on the far side of the desert when he was watching his father-in-law. When he got there, he somehow understood that the Lord is God. And when he entered into the wilderness, how are you going to feed three million people, Moses? I don't know. But the Lord is God. The Lord is God. He will take care of it. He met him and he understood that the, we, may, we may not understand why we're going through what we're going through at the time. Whether it's illness or finances or family. We may not understand why God is doing what he is doing. We might understand why he is allowing certain things to happen in our lives. We, I, I, I'm, quick to, I'm quick to say to I don't understand everything. But if we have individually come as believers to the understanding that, you know, there's a lot of Christians sitting in churches, and I call them Christians, who have, yet not, have not yet come to the realization and have not admitted that the Lord is in charge. He is God. When we come to that understanding, it enables us to believe and rely, and it enables us to give thanks even in the midst of difficulty. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One, as the song says. We may not understand it all, and the scripture doesn't tell us that we will understand it all. That's what faith is all about. Trusting, relying, depending upon God because he is God. Verse 3 says that he created us. God created us. And I dare say that most of us in this room at one point or another, we've come into, uh, in contact with, with the theory that says that all of the five, uh, roughly 5,000 functions in our body developed over naturally over eons of time and developed into male and female forms. You know, I don't have enough faith to believe that. I'll just admit it. I, I, I fail on that one. I don't have enough to faith to believe in evolution, but I do believe that God, that he hath made us and that we are his. We are his. And I'm grateful that I can say this morning that I believe that God created us. He created us in such a way. The scripture says he created us in his own image. He created us with a thinking mind and with a will and emotion which reflects who he is. <clears throat> and I'm grateful and then in verse 3, it says, we are his. We are his. If you're a born-again a born Christian this morning, you are God's by creation and by recreation. You are God's by birth because he created you and by new birth because he has given you spiritual life. It says you're the sheep of his pasture. And David, writing in Psalm 23, tells us that if the Lord is our shepherd, if we've come to the understanding that God is, the Lord is God and that he is ours, we are in relationship to him. In that psalm, David tells us that the Lord provides rest and nourishment. He provides protection and refreshment. He provides peace in the midst of turmoil, guidance and comfort, direction and joy. And ultimately, God provides eternal life. Do you know do you know that as a Christian, and now this sounds naive, I know that, I'm, I, I, I know that. But do you know that if you're a born-again Christian, everything that you need in life and in death is bound up in your relationship to God by Jesus Christ? Everything we need, rest and peace and direction and hope, we find in God. Everything. And then verse 5, it says, God is good. We've sung that. <clears throat> and every, and, and I, in fact, I said, it this, I said it this morning. Someone spoke to me and I said, yes, and God is good. And we say that so casually. We, 
you know, we, we say saying God is good is a little bit like saying Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have got a couple of dollars between them. <laughs> you know? God's goodness is bound up in his grace, and his grace is his unmerited favor of us. There is no, we can't conceive of the bounds of God's grace and mercy, and indeed he is good. In fact, the Apostle Paul, writing to the Romans in chapter 8, verse 32, said, He who did not spare his own son, the Father did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he, God, not also give him, the Son, freely, graciously give us all things? My son spent 30 years as a police officer here in Maricopa County. <clears throat> and we, we, sort of, we, we sort of grew callous to it, but when he first started out, he was just a kid. He was 20 years old, a little skinny kid. Tom, you surely remember my son? A little skinny kid. And he loved to work the midnight shift, one, because there were no administrators and no supervisors around. <laughs> and two, that's where all the action was, at night. And he'd come home once in a while and he would tell us, well, yeah, this guy had a gun between his knees when I stopped him or, or he had a gun stuck in the seat beside him or, you know, this guy pulled whatever. And, and uh, you know, it, I, one of the things he loved to do when we lived here in Sun Lakes, he loved to take his police car and pull up in front of our house and come in and go to the bathroom because he knew people were driving by. <laughs> And the cops are at the pastor's house again. <laughs> but I've often thought, if I knew beyond metaphysical certainty that if Michael went to work this day that he would not come back, what would I do to stop him from going to work that day? Now, I'm from the south side of Chicago. Remember that. If I knew beyond metaphysical certainty that if Michael went to work this day, what would I do to stop him? Break his leg? You know? And yet the father knew with metaphysical certainty that the son was going to die for you and for me. God he is so good. God he is so good. And the scripture text tells us his mercy endures forever. It tells us that his love endures forever. And the word endures in the Greek means secure, firm, and established. God's love is secure. It is firm. It is established. And we can rely on it. We can depend on it. In our sick bed, in our dying breath, we can rely on the fact that God's love is firm, it is secure, it is established, and that he loves us. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. History tells us that God is neither fickle nor forgetful. And the scriptures tell us that he sealed his love for us with the blood of his own son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. That being true, you and I sitting in this beautiful building in Sun Lakes, we have real cause, we have real reason to be thankful. Not just in November, not just in November, but every day of our life, we need to be thankful. We need to be grateful for what God has, has done for us. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. He has done great wonders. He has made the heavens and the earth. He governs the day and the night. But more important, astonishingly, is the fact that he is a great God. The creator of the universe actually cares about you and me. God actually cares about me because he loves me. He loves you. The gracious love of God endures 
forever.